Welcome everyone who's joining us to the Community IT Innovators webinar using Microsoft Teams at nonprofits. Today, we're gonna to give you some tips on using this multi-function tool better. We will provide a mini case study from nonprofit practitioner guests from Housing Alexandria, so you can learn from your peers' experiences. And if you have Office 365, then you have access to Teams, Microsoft's tool for chat, video conference, and calendars. But Teams does a lot more and integrates with lots of other tools beyond the Microsoft Office suite. Um, so that's what we're here today to talk about and hopefully give you some good tips. My name is Carolyn Woodard, and I'm the Outreach Director for Community IT, and I'll be the moderator today. I'm very, very happy to hear from our experts. So Elisa, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you so much. I am really excited to be here as well. My name is Elisa Mondragon. I am the Vice President of Operations here at Housing Alexandria. Um, I oversee uh, strategic operations for the entire business, corporate management, leadership, coaching, finance, HR, resident services, or IT. Um, so a little bit of everything. Um, and I've been with the organization for six years. And throughout my tenure here, I have helped um, guide the transition work from a, more of a startup board-led organization to a sustainable company that can serve Alexandria for years to come. That's great. Thank you. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, Alessandra, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi. Uh, my name is Alessandra or Allie Brolin, and I joined Housing Alexandria as an operations associate in last November. Um, I support our business operations through tasks like scheduling, calendar management, file management, and stocking the office with snacks and supplies. Lots more stuff as well. Um, I also assist Elisa on major projects like our upcoming move to a new office. And I'm very happy to be here to talk about Teams, which I have found useful in a lot of my work, including the examples that I just gave. Great. Thank you so much for being here. And I wanted to give you guys a chance to talk about Housing Alexandria and tell us a little bit more about your organization. Yeah, thank you. So Housing Alexandria is a nonprofit community developer committed to creating and preserving quality, affordable housing and community focused spaces to empower our residents and benefit Alexandria's neighborhoods. Uh, like Elisa said, oh, she might not have mentioned, actually, we have a staff of about 15, so we're not too big, um, and we currently operate on a hybrid work structure, so all team members are required to be in the office Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then one more day a week up to each um, team member's choice, and then everybody works two days a week at home, so Teams has been a vital tool for that work structure, um, the ability to chat quickly and informally or jump on formal meetings with video on. Um, and we'll talk about a lot of the ways that it's helped us a lot, but it's it's really important with that kind of hybrid work structure. No, for sure. And I think we, we are gonna be able to talk about that a little bit later. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Courtney, I know that you just hopped on. Um, I'm gonna give you a chance to um, get yourself together. And um, I was just gonna introduce myself. Um, I am the... Uh, marketing director for community IT and the outreach director. So I um, help moderate these webinars. I, um, before I worked at community IT, I also worked in uh, several different nonprofits from uh, small to large. And I was responsible for IT at a couple different places, um, which people will laugh at me now for saying that, but it is proof that you don't have to be the IT person to be able to oversee an IT department. Um, and have it work. So I know what nonprofits are going from, through from the back end, as well as from now working with community IT and supporting nonprofits. Um, and with that, I can turn it over to Courtney, if you would like to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Courtney Carroll. I am the Centralized Services Manager with Community IT. I, um, I've worked in IT for 12 and a half years. I worked at a municipality for um, uh, my local city. And I have also, um, I'm excited about uh, this webinar because Teams has played a vital role, especially with the pandemic. And um, we were asked or moved to Teams um, right when it started. And it has been very vital in completing day-to-day -day work and team meetings and things like that. 
uh, not only from my previous job, but now that my job is work from home permanently, um, it's been vital and getting to know my team, learning my new job with the MSP uh, community IT and I couldn't be happier with it and, and the many opportunity or the many features that it provides for collaborating and, and working together. Yeah, I know. I was so happy that you were available to be on this webinar today because I know that you have used Teams and uh, get a lot out of it. So I'm really happy that you could join us. And um, so I already introduced myself and I want to introduce before we begin, if you're not familiar with Community IT, a little bit more about us. We're a 100% employee owned managed services provider. So we provide outsourced IT support. We work exclusively with nonprofit organizations and our mission is to help nonprofits accomplish their missions through the effective use of technology. We're big fans of what well-managed IT can do for your nonprofit. And we serve nonprofits across the United States. We've been doing this for over 20 years and we are technology experts. So we are consistently given an MSP 501 recognition for being a top MSP. And that's an honor we received again in 2022. <laughs> um, we are vendor agnostic when it comes to our clients. So in that we don't have agreements with vendors. So we don't have motivation to put clients in a specific tool because we're reselling it. We get a benefit from that. However, we do think of ourselves as a best of breed MSP. So it's our job to know the landscape, what tools are available, reputable, widely used, and we make recommendations on that basis for our clients. Um, today, we're talking about a single tool uh, through Microsoft, um, which is a cloud port platform that many nonprofits are using. So today, we wanted to give you some insights based on our experience and that of our guests and many of our clients. Um, there are lots of reasons why nonprofits might choose to be a mostly Microsoft workspace. Uh, once you make that choice, Microsoft makes so many products that integrate that it can influence your choices after that, that it's your platform. And Teams, I think, is a good example of a portal that lets you, you know, into the world of all the other different tools and applications. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more on. Um, so if that describes your organization, um, you've come to the right place. I wanted to say for the record that Community IT does support Google Workspace. We support all Mac shops as well. And we have some webinars on our website that describe uh, that kind of management uh, and even managing a hybrid environment. So it can be done, but today we're gonna focus on this tool Teams and talk about the ways to get the most out of it and all the apps and products that integrate with it. Okay, so our learning objectives for today are what Teams can do and how you do it on Teams. <laughs> um, we wanted to learn about Teams, uh, learn tips on how to use Teams better beyond just the chat, understand how to select Teams as a tool or a Teams types tool. So Housing Alexandria is going to go through with you kind of a little bit how they made their decisions to use Teams as much as they do. All right, um, so now we are going to start off with a poll. We like to start with a poll, get things going. So this question is, how long have you used Teams? Okay, so the options are, we're thinking about starting using Teams. We just started this year. We started seriously in 2020. I put that in there as a you know potential year that you might have moved over to using Teams a lot more than you had before. And then uh, another option is you have always used Teams, like as long as you have been able to. And then another option with um, not applicable. So you're here for some other reason, you're not with an organization uh, that uses Teams, but you're trying to learn about it. Um, Elisa, could you read the responses? Sure, happy to. Um, so 17% of you said thinking about starting. Uh, 22% said we just started this year. Um, like many of us, we started seriously 53% uh, in 2020. 5% uh, have always used Teams and 3% said not applicable. All right, great. Thank you so, so much. Um, so that's a pretty good bell curve there. Um, and I think we weren't surprised um, that a lot of people, a lot of organizations started really using Teams uh, when they had to go remote, and it was a good way to, you know, keep in touch and keep some of those office interactions going. All right, so um, we actually have another poll um, that can help us learn a little bit more about you um, also. 
which is how big is your nonprofit? What size is your nonprofit? Um, and of course, your nonprofit could be in different um, stages of growth, like you could be a large nonprofit um, that acts kind of like a startup, you could be a startup nonprofit that's growing quickly, like you're small now, you're going to be growing, um, you could be a kind of middle aged, uh, middle of the road nonprofit that's been doing what you've been doing for a long time, um, and are using teams as well for that. So the options are you are a one to 10 person nonprofit. An 11 to 25 staff nonprofit, 26 to 100 staff, 101 plus, or not applicable. And um, Ali, would you mind reading the results? Sure. 22% um, said their nonprofit is 1 to 10 people. 21% said their nonprofit is 11 to 25 people. 37% said their nonprofit is 26 to 100 people. 17% said their nonprofit is over 100 people, and 3% said not applicable. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. And so now we're going to um, get along into a little bit more information about what Teams does. I know we have a bunch of questions coming in, um, and some people have some pretty specific questions about um, Teams features. So I'm going to ask you all to kind of hang tight for a moment. We're going to go through some of the things that it does, um, and then we're going to um, have the case study from Housing Alexandria. And if your question still hasn't been answered at that point, we will have Q&A at the end, and we'll go back through these questions. So if you've put your question in and uh, we haven't answered it yet, uh, don't, don't worry. We're going to get to them. All right, so what does Teams do? So hopefully all of you on this uh, webinar are familiar with it, but um, we like to think of it as a portal into the Microsoft world. Um, you can do a calendar, phone, video chat, chat, um, web. you can do webinars through Teams. We're not doing that today, but um, it's possible. I've been on them. You can share files with your colleagues in or outside of your organization, giving them permissions to edit or view files that you've shared with them. The files are not actually stored in Teams. They're stored in a different Microsoft application called SharePoint. Um, but one of the cool things about Teams is you don't really need to know that. You can just share them with your colleagues uh, in either a chat or a meeting, and your colleagues can access it through Teams, and they never need to know that it's in SharePoint either. Um, you can add other Microsoft apps. Uh, integration is easy, and it's, it's built in, as many Microsoft tools do integrate with each other. You can create internal teams. So within the Teams um, app, you can create like a, a mini team that's like your finance team. And then you can add the people that are on that team. Um, you can also have one-on-one -on -one chats with people or one-on-one -on -one calls with people. You can use Teams for your business phones. Um, one of the cool features about it is you can set away or focus time. So you can kind of have it operate as an um, admin assistant for you and telling people when you're available for calls or not. People can schedule, you know, your colleagues can schedule time on your calendar internally. Um, it's just full of really useful tools. But <laughs> I know, Courtney, you were um, going to talk a little bit about the end of this slide. Some of the things about Teams, it can be overwhelming. Yes, so Teams can be complicated um, in the workflow that it offers, and it can make com uh, conversations, files, tasks, different things that you're working on hard to find. And also, it's really hard to get different teams and different groups to use Teams consistently. We've I've found in many situations that I've worked with. And I think many people on the registration questions also mentioned that, like, how do I get everyone at my organization using Teams? And I know that I've worked at organizations too, where it seems like half the people are still like, you need to email them and half of the people are like, just chat me on Teams. So that can definitely be something that's a, a struggle. Um, so here we have a graphic uh, with a little bit more. Um, we put Microsoft Teams there in the center of this little spider web. Um, and so you can see from this graphic, all of the different things that you can integrate with Microsoft Teams or that you can access through Teams. So I don't know, Courtney, would you like to talk a little bit more about that from this um, graphic? We are going to show on our next slide, we have a graphic that shows you kind of more what Teams looks like, but this is more of the overview um, in Microsoft world 
of all of the things that it connects to. So yes, um, when you create, you're able to use Teams to create team or Teams. You can in Teams, you can have um, uh, once you create a team, you can share and create a SharePoint site when that team is created. And as part of that, it allows you to go through many of the documents that um, you can use as part of that team for whatever purpose it is for projects. Um, so Microsoft Word, um, Access PowerPoint, and you can use collaboration with those. Um, you can build and uh, use reports for different things, which will tie your teams to uh, Power BI and analytics. And then for other, you can also view and sync your, see your calendar from Teams um, from Outlook and Outlook. And something I love is having the Teams on your phone. So you can, like, if you, somebody has scheduled something with you and you're like, wait, when was that a point? When was, when was I going to meet with that person? You can see it right um, from your phone when you're out and about. Um, so all of those, of course, it's making it this easy also makes it a little bit complex and can be overwhelming. Um, all right. So speaking of overwhelming, here is a slide <laughs> with um, a, a little bit more about what you will see when you are in Teams. And so I thought for um, people who are a little bit more visual and wanted to see like, well, what are you talking about with Teams? And if you haven't seen Teams before, or if you have and you don't know all of these different pieces that are on there, um, you can see the different things that you can do. So um, if you look across the top, I'm not gonna read all of them to you, but you can see um, this was this is one that always catches me is up under where your, um, where your photo is, your profile. That's where you can change a lot of the settings um, and set you know, yourself as a way, et cetera. Um, you can search. This is one that I use all the time. So as we were seeing before, somebody has shared a file with you. Um, instead of having to go into SharePoint um, and look for it that way, you can think like that was in that meeting and it was, um, it was Cheryl who shared it with me. And so you can go in and I think it was called this. You can go into your search and you can pull up um, the, the file that you were looking for. So I find that extremely helpful. And it will find files, um, chat, people. It, it, it um, searches across the different um, uh, aspects of Teams. Um, there in the middle, you can see add tabs. I know, I think Courtney, you were gonna talk about that. That's where you would add the different apps that you're connecting through Teams. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, you can add tab, or you you're able to um, add personal apps. You're able to add apps from the app store if they're not already downloaded. So you can view uh, when you hit the three dots to view or add apps. You can uh, view only one app at a time, and it always shows your me most recent app that was used. That makes sense. And I think in this um, slide as well, it kind of shows you Power BI. Someone has added that um, here right at the top. And so it makes it easy too that when you're then if it's something that you use a lot, like you're always going to Power BI to show reports, et cetera, it's right there in Teams and you can access it there from, from this page. Um, you know, you can start a new chat. You can here over here on the left where you see every team has channels. Um, this is what we were talking about before. You can set up a sub team that is like your finance department or your marketing department or a team that comes together to work on something um, that might be a temporary project team as well. And you can add people to that. And then they have, you know, they're, they're um, within that world. They all have access to the things that they're, that they're sharing there. Um, uh, move around teams, you can switch between your activity feed, chat, meetings, um, your calendar, your uh, notifications, alerts when somebody has um, mentioned you or responded to something that you were chatting to them. We had a question uh, already come in through Q&A. How can you change those um, settings so that you're alerted when uh, you've been, um, there's been a response like in a team? So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, find personal apps. Um, as Courtney was saying, you can add apps here that you use a lot. Um, and so all of this is um, available as a little kind of like a site map of the things that you can do once you're in once you're in teams. 
Okay, and then we just also wanted to kind of quickly go over this isn't we've mentioned SharePoint a couple of times SharePoint and OneDrive. This isn't a webinar about SharePoint or OneDrive. We do have a webinar on SharePoint that we did last summer. You can go back and look at that. But I thought this was a great graphic because it kind of shows you this interconnection um, or certain maybe sometimes circular logic around using Teams as your portal where you share these um, this content with others. And so, um, you know, we don't have time to get into it completely today, but OneDrive is where, you know, when you share, save something, it's saved to your OneDrive, your individual um, folder. And then you also have access to SharePoint where you might have files that are shared with you from someone else's folder or another team's folder. I don't know, Courtney, if you wanted to um, <laughs> give a little bit better explanation than my uh, quick explanation there, as I understand it. So Teams' main focus is, I would say, um, the, the collaboration, um, being able to do the meet to meet the meetings face to face, um, being able to tie a whole lot of different data and apps together. OneDrive focuses on documents uh, as a, it works as a document repository and SharePoint can be a hub of various I guess, sites, documents, um, different ways to present data or information um, as, a, as, as more of a, a website. So they allow for working, they can all work together, but at the same time, they all have their separate features and functions that um, are provided. And I think it's just so, I can't stress enough how useful it is when you are working on a document collaboratively, like the slides that we worked on uh, for today's webinar. I shared those from our SharePoint with Housing Alexandria, uh, with Elisa and Alessandra, and we were all able to work together on these slides um, and put them together, uh, even though they resided in our SharePoint at Community IT. So it's just, but as again, like nobody really even needs to know where they are. We just all were working on them together. So I feel like that's a very um, useful feature of this. Um, but if you do know more about how your SharePoint is set up at your organization, of course, you can do more sophisticated things. All right, so now we are going to launch another poll. Um, and this is, uh, we're going to ask you how you are using Teams. Um, so are you using it? And this is a multiple choice. So you can click all of the ones that apply to you. So are you using internal chat? Are you using uh, video meetings, external and uh, internal? Are you doing file sharing, using it as a portal to SharePoint and OneDrive, which you just mentioned? Are you using it for team knowledge management? So this is something that um, Housing Alexander is going to talk a little bit more about. And we had some questions about um, setting teams up to help you with workflow for different um, tasks that you're doing. Um, and are any of you using it as your only phone system? So you take all of your phone calls. You don't have an office phone anymore. You're not maybe even in an office and you use Teams. You have a Teams number and you use that for um, external calls as well as for internal calls um, and a webinar platform. Um, are you using it to do webinars um, or is this not an applicable question? And um, Courtney, would you mind reading the results from this? Sure. It says um, of those using Teams, 65% are using it for internal chat, 76% for video meetings, internal and external, 52% for file sharing, um, portal to SharePoint and OneDrive, 32% to team no knowledge management, 10% as it's your only phone system, internal and external, 14% webinar as a webinar platform, and 13% that was NA or something else. Okay, sounds great. Thank you. So a lot of organizations using a lot of the different features. Um, okay, so next we are going to turn it over to Housing Alexandria. So um, Elisa and Alessandra, would you like to take us through your case study of how you chose Teams and then some little tips on how you're using it? 
Yeah, happy to do that. Um, thank you so much. Um, so I wanted to start with where we as an organization were before we were using Teams, before we were using SharePoint. So prior to January of 2020, we used a shared drive, which we access via VPN to store all of our files and work collaborative. We had in-person meetings. I think everyone prior to the pandemic was used to going to people's office, have visitors, collaborate in person. Um, we used a third party conference call line. So it was just like a free conference call line um, or we would just call each other. Uh, and then we also had a physical water cooler for team building, catching up shows, et cetera. Um, we had a lot of challenges accessing our files via VPN when we were working remotely. We wouldn't work remotely very often, but when we did, um, accessing our files via VPN caused a lot of problems. And we actually explored other solutions that were not Microsoft to do file sharing. But one of the benefits of working with community IT and you know, having a dedicated IT professional was that they were able to tell us like, hey, you're actually already paying for this. This is part of your Microsoft license. And so we dropped everything else and, and we decided to make the transition from the VPN and this other source to SharePoint. Um, right at uh, February of 2020, which was very serendipitous, you know, all of this happened and then the pandemic happened and we had to push even further. So the transition into SharePoint really allowed us to be able to explore additional um, services that Microsoft uh, offers. So um, one of the, actually the main reason we chose Teams was because it, it does work so collaborative, so cohesive with SharePoint. We save everything on SharePoint, SharePoint or OneDrive. We don't have any more uh, physical files. Everything lives online and the fact that we're able to access everything so easily through Teams and any other Microsoft tools like Word or Excel or anything else um, like forms that Microsoft has, has been really, really useful for us. Um, as Ali mentioned, it really has helped us with our hybrid um, work structure. So then we're able to move our work as we need to. Uh, one of the changes that we did make is that with a regular license, we don't have a call-in number. So maybe that's a challenge that some of you are facing that people don't want to use Teams or called, is you have to pay a little bit extra to get a dial-in number. So I highlight it here. Um, as we were transitioning in early in the pandemic, people were still figuring out how does Teamworks, WebEx, Zoom, all of the other options. So having a dial-in number made it easy for those people to access it. And since then we've kept it because we work with um, a, ton, a, a lot of community members that may don't have access to the internet, may have never used the internet themselves. So, you know, this creates a more inclusive environment where people have various different options to join a team meeting. Um, but another reason that we really like using Teams is because it helped us stay connected and have this virtual water cooler. We're able to have like share memes and pictures of kids, et cetera. Um, so it's really important for our culture and values that our team members feel like we're accessible to everyone. You know, any entry level team member can reach to a more executive level team member with a quick chat. You know, there's additional options. Sometimes when you go to a leadership's office, it feels like you're going to the principal's office. So you try to avoid it or, you know, asking questions. You're like, oh my gosh, I should have, I should know the answer to that. But Teams chats creates um, that ability to be able to communicate a lot easier without having to write an email um, or a phone call every single time. We can go to the next slide. Um, so one of the benefits that we really, really like um, Teams for is because it reduces the email content. There's a saying that we have in the office, which is it's a meeting that could have been an email that could have been a chat message. So trying to reduce those and trying to, um, again, get clarifications about a project, deadlines, you know, who do you want to include in an email? It just makes us a, a lot of ease of communication. Um, you can set your messages as important or urgent if you need someone to answer you, you know, quicker. Um, sometimes you just need the green light of something that person's on a, on a meeting or somewhere else. Um, so that makes it a lot easier. You can also tag the person if you are in a group chat. So let's say that you have six other people and you need, you know, Jane to answer. You can 
at that person and make sure that that person is able to get an additional no notification that they need to respond to your uh, comments. Um, you know, as we keep saying, it really is a collaboration tool and it helps us keep continuous records of meetings um, or work that we're doing. So, you know, we can have three different chats with six different people going on at the same time, but our thoughts are being organized because, you know, all of the content for one particular topic is, is kept in that, in that chat together. Um, one of the challenges that we've noticed is that there's an overwhelming source of notifications. And again, that might be another reason why people are not using Teams or are resisting. So a good way of trying to avoid that is to help set guidelines and boundaries for your team to turn off the work and for you to commit as well um, on, on what you have said. So for example, if you know your little bubble is red, just make sure that you are telling your team members, don't message me unless it's urgent. Um, but you shouldn't do that as well because otherwise they're going to think that everything is urgent. So make sure that whatever boundaries that you set, you follow them as well. Um, as uh, Carolyn mentioned, you can set snooze hours, um, do not disturb, you know, your six o'clock on the weekends. And again, try to reduce those notifications because sometimes it can get very overwhelming and that's why people just completely turn it off and don't want to even address it because it's just too much. Um, so again, another challenge is getting everyone to use the platform. That's something that we hear all the time and many of you have commented. So try to coach your team on the appropriate use of teams. Um, so, you know, first I want to make sure that you are um, checking with your leadership and your HR team. Um, you know, set the boundaries on like, hey, if you have an HR request or, you know, requesting time off, don't do that on, on Teams unless your HR approves it because, you know, hey, I asked for that day off and you saw it, but, you know, what's going on here? Try to avoid all of that. So setting those um, standards and guidance is really important at the beginning. Um, but another really good way of implementing Teams is start small. You don't have to make all of the changes all at once because that's usually where you get more of a resistance. If you start small with a small task, small project, people are, are able to dabble, get a little bit more used to it and see the value that they're adding, that Teams is adding to their work um, and are more likely to have a buy-in. So um, another uh, good, practice is to tie your success metrics to it. So if you want to go to the next slide, um, I'll talk a little bit more about a specific case. So as Ali mentioned, we are moving offices. So um, one of our success metrics is that we as a team that is um, in charge of moving our office is, are you using this to-do list? Are you communicating in the chat? Are you, you know, following through? And if you're not, then you know we want to make sure that we're correcting that action. But it's a little bit more digestible when this is the only project that they have to follow it and everything else they might be able to continue to do whatever works best for them. So this to-do list that Ali put together is really, really useful. Um, it's easy for all of us to access and to edit. The app is so friendly when we're you know, moving from the office, home, or whatever else we might be working, uh, we can access and view the charts, schedules, assign, um, track progress all on our phones, but we can also, of course, do it on the desktop as well. Um, one of the greatest things about this is that you don't have to have meetings for every single time you want to update. You can just log in, you know, again, tag someone, um, you know, just kind of follow the, the uh, conversation on a particular topic on a bucket. Um, so then it reduces the amount of time that you have to be you know, meeting with each team member. Uh, another tip that we have is that don't feel like you need to create this at the beginning of your project. We started meeting about our office move and collecting information and data and you know, all of the material. And once we started, having the need to be more organized, everyone was like, yes, this is a great answer because we can see everything together. So again, sometimes the need may need to come before the idea because then more people will start seeing the benefits and the value that it's adding to your project and your organization 
um, and are more likely to share that success in other parts of their work. Wow, oh, uh, yeah. we had a quick question that came in on the chat, which is um, the slide that you're sharing now. Is that an app within Teams or can you talk a little bit about that's just in Teams, right? Um, yes. So, Ali, do you want to take that one? Sure, yeah. So, um, this is a list that I created. So, I was like in the Teams app, but it did prompt me um, which program I wanted to use to create this. So it's also um, Microsoft Planner, which is part of the Microsoft Office suite. So I didn't have to go to the Planner app to do this, but I chose Planner as like the way that I was creating this to-do list. And then it's using the formatting that um, Planner comes with um, to do the different buckets and then items in each bucket. But it, it lives in Teams. So I can open up my Teams and go to our strategic plan channel, like the, the team channel. And then one of the files at the top of the um, bar there, one of the tabs is this list and it's the office move to do list. Um, and then it has everything structured the way planner structures things. Um, so some other uses that we've had with teams is capacity building. Um, it's a lot easier for uh, some of our team members to again, use Teams when they start seeing what other options they have. They'll start using it more for their meetings or for their projects. Um, one really good option that has started, um, it was this supply request because it's so intuitive. People always have the same information. They usually would email it or fill an Excel sheet, but we created a supply request directly on Teams and everyone just knows that's where they go and where they use it. So again, just creating more processes on Teams and putting it in as a first option for um, your organization, then more people are going to think that's the first thing I should start with. So we used it to improve processes that includes our onboarding and offboarding process. So when a new team member starts, that's the first thing that they see is, oh, we're using Teams you know, they're already in a transition phase, so they're more likely to adapt to it. Another tip is to collect employee feedback through a form, um, which can also be distributed to teams. Uh, as I mentioned, we use it a lot to remove barriers in communication. We wanna make sure that our team feels like they can um, have this virtual open door policy. So when we create more forms and we can do this from, you know, hey, what kind of color would you prefer for our new office walls to uh, employee feedback satisfaction, then again, they're starting to get used to the continuous use and repetitiveness of teams. Um, and then we also like discover a lot of things just by playing around with teams. We encourage a lot of our team members. There's a little um, icon that I put here on the bottom on your chat. Um, there's an option for like sending praise, like you did a great job. There's an option for like requesting ch like a more official check-in on a project. Um, you can link your Adobe sign and have documents signed through it and saved in your Adobe. So there's a lot of different options that maybe not all of them work for you, but if you play around, there might be one that you're like, oh, actually, this is a great option for me at this moment. Um, so, so these are some of the other features that we're currently using Teams for. Um, one of the things that we continue to ask is, how can we build capacity? How can we reduce costs? So Teams is really a tool that you can use every day that has the ability to increase capacity and plan for the future. So probably the one thing that we use Teams the most other than chats and uh, meetings is this screen sharing feature, which when we discovered it was a game changer. So if you go to your chat on the top right corner, there's, I highlight it under uh, the red. So when we are meeting in person, instead of having to pull up our TV or screen or anything, we can just share the screen also without joining a meeting. And we really wish we would have known this before we spent all this money buying big TV so we can share screens because it turns out that we could just do it on our own computers without. Um, you know, joining a meeting. So if you are trying to reduce costs, you don't have the space for a TV, you, you know, also are very mobile, maybe in a coffee shop and you want to share screens and you don't want to sit super close next to each other. Um, this is a really good feature that, uh, that we use a lot. 
the Teams voice line. So we use our phones completely on Teams. And this was really helpful. We used to use Comcast, but the app was not user-friendly whatsoever. The space, you know, the, the hardware, we just never used it. We weren't in the office. We could use the extra space in, you know, reducing the, um, the hoteling when people were sharing spaces. Um, but also there was a cost with renting the equipment. This was just so much easier. Um, the, again, the app is super ESA friendly. We can reassign phone numbers when a team member leaves. Uh, and the best thing is we have the do not disturb time. Again, reducing those notifications has been really helpful for a team to have more valuable work-life balance. Um, so they have a stronger buying into teams. And the last thing I wanted to say was you know, really try and try again with teams. We have tried several things at different times with different projects and they don't always work out, uh, but that doesn't mean that they might not work in the future. So, you know, just because it didn't work for you in the past or in the particular project doesn't mean that it can't work for you or other team members in the future. So keep exploring and hopefully you can find a use for teams in the near future. Thank you so much. This is a great rundown. We got a bunch of questions coming in about phones and your experience. Um, so I know we saved some time to get to this, so I'm, I'm glad that we're we're getting along now. So I wanted to go back over our learning objectives um, that we wanted to learn about Teams and what it can do. I think we can check that off. I mean, we've scratched the surface, I think, in some ways, but um, it's just definitely such a a valuable, useful um, tool. So we gave you a little bit of, of some of what it can do. Uh, learning tips on how to use Teams better beyond chat, um, which is kind of the gateway. You know, it's like you you open up Teams your first time, and you're like, well, I can you know chat to this colleague or you know ask my supervisor something, and then. I think that's a good advice, you know, for complicated tools in general is to start small and then keep adding on. And as you said, just said, Elisa, to keep experimenting and seeing what's um, what's available. And like sometimes I'm like, you know, what does this button do? Like, <laughs> what happens if I do that? Um, and different things that you can attach to it. And I love your idea of trying things a second or third time. I know I tried to use the whiteboard, Microsoft whiteboard about a year ago, and I was like, and then I had a colleague using it just a couple months ago, and I was like, wow, this is a lot better than I remember it. <laughs> they had changed some of the features and made it more, um, more user-friendly. So I, I definitely love that tip. Um, and then I, I thought you did a great job of going over how to select a Teams type tool and why some of these features made it really attractive to your organization and maybe to some of the other organizations that are out there that are thinking about using it on this webinar or maybe have started using it and might want to invest like in the phone, the, the additional cost for, to have the phones. Um, so I think that that was great. Um, okay, so I wanted to make sure to thank you. And um, we have some time for questions. Um, and I know we have Courtney on as well. Um, she's answering some of the questions uh, of the more technical things on the background. But um, someone had a question for Housing Alexandria. Did you have a Teams consultant helping you explore these different features and uh, kind of maximize your effectiveness using it? Or did you figure it out yourself? Um, we used a lot of YouTube. <laughs> that was our, our consultant. We played around a lot and, you know, we just Googled a lot of things and watched a lot of YouTube videos. Um, I actually think that Microsoft has really good um, examples and tools that they help us with, but YouTube is, has been our best friend when trying to figure things out. No, I love that. It's like a, you know, so do it yourself. Some, a lot of nonprofits have that do it yourself um, attitude. And then trying to find time to prioritize and make enough time to spend on the project to, to get it really working at your organization. Clearly, this is giving you benefits that make it worth the time that you have spent um, figuring out how to use it the best way and tailoring it to the way that your organization uses it. So, um, that's really helpful. Um, there's a question. Can you include attendees in Teams meetings if they don't have Microsoft 365? Yes, you can uh, definitely include attendees. The only challenge there is that they might not be able to access the information afterwards. So like the chat history, if they don't have Teams, 
they wouldn't be able to access it afterwards, but they can definitely join and participate once they're in the call. Yep, that makes sense. I mean, you can add people like with a Gmail account or, um, you know, yeah. other email accounts. It's just mm -hmm. someone had asked that as well as like, how do you use Teams outside of your organization? It's super easy. You just invite them to a meeting um, and uh, then you go from there. They, they get an invite and they click on it and there you are. Yeah. Um, so we had a question of, have you been able to save the cost of Zoom licenses by using Teams instead? So, or you were talking about your previous phone, um, what you were using for your phones. Did you see any savings or is it convenience or, or how did that work? Um, so for as far as Zoom licenses, we still have one when we need to have like large webinars. We do a lot of work with the community. So sometimes when we need to have like 300 people in a, in, you know, in a call, we'll just do Zoom. Um, but we only need to have you know, one Zoom license instead of one for every single team member. Uh, as, and then with the phones, we really saw the value of our dollar being used there. Because even though Comcast was maybe a little bit less expensive, our team members were so frustrated with that that they just were using their personal phone numbers. So sometimes, you know, the value is in, are people using it and are they getting the benefit, you know, and again, an added value to their work. Um, so it's, that's how we um, recognize that. But with the Zoom and, you know, WebEx and any of the, those other ones, we can use the free version if we needed to, but everyone pretty much uses Teams. Um, we have another question about the voice um, services, the calls. Do you, have you found it reliable? Like, does it drop calls? Is it some voice over IP um, services have you know difficulties? So um, have you had any problems with it? I haven't. Um, Ali, I know you use it more because Ali screens all of our phone calls. So have you had any different experiences? No, I haven't had any issues um, with dropped calls or weird um, service or anything like that. Um, I have noticed uh, like sometimes when a call comes in, it rings on my phone because I have the Teams app and on my laptop. And the, sometimes those are out of sync with each other, which is sort of funny. So I'll answer it on my phone and it's like still ringing on my laptop, but the person on the phone can hear me and it just, you know, the laptop catches up. Um, and um, it always asks that like at the end, like how was your service? And it's always fine. <laughs> Yeah, I think I've I've heard that as well. I mean, there it's comparable to other um, other services, and then it just has this extra feature of being really convenient if you're already using Teams. Um, so we have another question about the phones. Does the phone system allow for a main line that will separate out like a normal phone system, and does it cost you another license? Um, they are also trying to go from Comcast to Zoom, but um, they may also be doing Microsoft um, 365. So just a quick question about, I think it's pretty sophisticated about being able to handle, um, you know, like the things that having a main line and then having a directory and having maybe follow on calls, like it can ring through to your cell phone. It can ring through to a different phone. It can uh, do a lot of different uh, things like that. So you want to talk about that? Yeah, so it definitely can have a main line if you want. It really just depends on your preference. So Allie is the one that screens all of our calls, um, but we didn't want her to be her, the main line be her phone number. So she has an additional license. So that was our choice. You don't have to do it. You can have, like, if you have a receptionist, the main line is their phone number. Um, Teams actually also sells phones. We don't have physical phones on any of them, but if you wanted to do like the receptionist, you can also have a physical phone in your office. Otherwise, just your computer or your cell phone works. Um, and yeah, so when you dial our phone number, you get an attendant, you can you know click the extension or select option one for Elisa or, or you know, it has all of those same features that um, are traditional and I know in Comcast, if that's what you're using, it has all of the exact same features. It even sends us an email with a transcript of voicemails and it, it's really helpful. Um, that's great, thank you. So there've been a bunch of questions. Um, there's another question that came in. Um, did you do formal Teams training um, versus hands-on learning on your own training? I know you talked a little bit about some tips to get everyone on your team using Teams. 
but maybe could you talk a little bit more about specifically, did you do like sit down trainings with people? Do you have trainings when you onboard new staff? Like, how does that work? Um, I'm going to defer that one to Ali because she's taking over all of our orientation and training. And I know she has some plans there. Yeah, um, it's sort of a combination. Um, we definitely, so we have sort of a sit down training to go over SharePoint, OneDrive, like kind of all the software that we use um, to explain like logistically how they work and also culturally how we use them. And then there's also, um, you know, when someone is new, there's sort of that informal um, level of training too, where the last person that we had join us um, in his like first couple of days, he was like, when am I supposed to team someone? When am I supposed to email them? And I was like, if it's something you would like, knock on their door and like say it to them really quickly, then that's a team chat. If it's something that you would need a, to have a more formal conversation on, that's an email. So, you know, you kind of ease into it also just checking in with people, but we do include it in our new employee onboarding along with the other software stuff. That's great, thank you. Um, I think we've got time maybe for one more question. Um, and there's actually, I'm gonna combine a couple of different questions and some stuff that you've talked about already, but um, it, a lot of questions around this, getting everyone to use it. Um, so one is how do you keep the less techie people in your organization motivated to learn and use Teams? And how do I wean staff from Zoom <laughs> because we don't have to pay extra for teams? So I think both of those are kind of questions about how, how do you get people um, together using teams? And I know you've talked a little bit about it before, but do you have any kind of last words of wisdoms of tips you can try? Do you want to start, Ali, and then I can follow up? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I would say, as we've said, it's kind of the small buildup, getting people comfortable with it. Um, a specific example of that that I found when I started with Housing Alexandria and I was new to Teams is the informal like calls. We have sort of a, an informal policy of we don't have our cameras on. If you're doing an internal meeting, you know, if, if it's like Wednesday, I'm working from home and I'm just like, Elisa, can I get on the phone with you really quick and ask you about this thing? Um, we're both, it's like normal that it's expected. We're both cameras off that whole time. And I have found that that mitigates the fatigue from being on um, like online meetings so much. So I think that's um, a pretty big incentive for transitioning people. If you can do it in that, like maybe your big team meetings are still Zoom are still like big long meetings are more formal in Zoom. But um, if you get people kind of comfortable with the informal stuff, I think that um, it can be shorter meetings. It can be cameras off. And those things will make them enjoy being on Teams and then be more um, familiar with the whole platform. And then you can transition like more and more stuff into Teams. And I would also say um, kind of what we were talking about with the office move where we have that to-do list, that's something that we introduced like in the middle of that project. So finding places where someone wants more organization and then introducing teams as a new tool there, I think can like get the ball rolling on that kind of thing. Um, and I think it's it's just keep it small over time. And then Elisa has some good ideas on this also. Yeah, I think just to um, add to that is making teams like the first option. So we added the add-in to all of our Outlook email. Uh, and when you schedule a meeting and you just you know, click add invite, it automatically makes it a Teams meeting. So it's just like a second nature to us. Like we just, yes, Teams meeting immediately. We have to take extra steps to make it a Zoom or any other type of meeting. So that's been really helpful is putting Teams as the first option and people tend to default to the first option and then make changes somewhere else. But um, I think everything that Ali said, you know, I would just echo um, starting small, and you know, making it a little bit more comfortable for people to be in the space and more people are gonna um, choose it. Um, but the last thing is sometimes it's accessibility issues. I would recommend maybe talking to your team members. Why are they like, is, is there an additional reason? Um, you saw all my uh, images, they're all in dark mode. 
it just helps with my vision a lot better. Maybe people don't know how to do that. Again, maybe the notification. So maybe it's not necessarily teams that they have a challenge with, it's something else there. So, you know, asking your team members, maybe creating a form via Teams and sending it out <laughs> to collect some of that data. Um, there might be additional reasons that, you know, maybe we haven't even thought about and just someone has challenges with it. So definitely keep the conversation open with your team and see what they have to say. That makes sense. And I think um, another probably big piece of it is that you're in a you know leadership position and you're on team. So it's like, that's where people are going to find you. So when you have leadership who are championing it and using it, like really using it, then um, I think that also helps other people come along if that's where they can chat with you and just get a quick question answered for sure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elisa and Alessandra and Courtney for joining us. Thank you so much, Housing Alexandra, for sharing these tips with us and spending as much time as I know you did on the slides in this presentation. Really appreciate it. And I think it was just so helpful for all of the people on the webinar today to see how other nonprofit practitioners are using this tool. So I really thank you so much. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Carolyn. Thanks, Courtney. Thank you, everyone.